Hi, and welcome to our tutorial on why Kubernetes needs object storage. My name is Daniel Valdivia, and I work at Engineer here at MinIO. Over the next 15 minutes, I hope to show you the value of integrating object storage into your Kubernetes ecosystem, not only for your applications, but also to support your operational workflows. I want to start by talking about the symbiosis between applications and operations. We've seen that Kubernetes has enabled a great plethora of ways of deploying applications uh, on top of it. But not only that, it also simplifies how operations actually it's deployed and operated uh, around these applications. And the symbiosis between these two areas of IT has come in the sense that operations is providing services and infrastructure that the applications are, uh, need to, to run smoothly. But not only uh, the connection goes in this direction, applications are also providing a set of data and metrics that operations can collect in order to monitor and improve the way things are running, right? So the, the ecosystem to support both of these uh, approaches is very, uh, is very ample. So, but for this conversation, I only want to focus on the operation side of things. So we've seen in the last few years that technology megatrends come in pairs. We saw this with the introduction of Hadoop MapReduce. This general purpose computational framework was introduced back in the early 2000s, and it came paired with a nice distributed file system called HDFS. And we saw that this was, from now on, this was the, mo the, the approach to actually deploying uh, applications, right? So, there will be a compute layer and a, and a pairing storage layer. So for example, we saw this with Nova and Swift, right? And also when EC2 was introduced, it was nicely paired with S3. But since the introduction of Kubernetes, we have not seen what is the right pair for Kubernetes. But we know what the, the right pair for Kubernetes is, and that is object storage. We say this because object storage is uniquely positioned uh, to make your community's applications and workflows so, uh, scalable in both directions, both vertically and horizontally. So there's some, some guiding principles that modern object storage needs to fit in order to, to satisfy your needs on top of Kubernetes. First, it needs to be performant, right? It needs to be extremely fast and it needs to be able to run on top of hard disk drives and choke on those drives. Or if it's running on faster NVMe SSDs, you should be able to saturate the, the, the network, right? Not only that, if you have very fast and performant object storage, this will enable a whole new world of uh, workflows, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning workflows, uh, also to big data and analytics uh, type, type of workflows. It needs to be scalable. From terabytes to exabytes, you need to do it in a way that's seamless and doesn't disrupt operations. Modern storage solutions can no longer tolerate object storage that needs to rebalance every time you are adding capacity. It should be software defined, right? We, you cannot depend, you cannot have these, all these cloud native applications that really don't, don't care the type of hardware they're running on top of. You know, so it needs to be paired with a software solution for storage that can scale and really doesn't care about how it's actually being run. And it needs to be simple. Simple is hard. Right, it needs dedication, it needs, it needs scoping, and it's very important because when things are designed in a simple fashion, they're easier to operate and they are also easier to scale. So the proof of this, you can see it in the ecosystem. If we were to place object storage at the center of the ecosystem, and one of the popular object storage solutions out there is MinIO, uh, you will see that there's a set of infrastructure services that can leverage object storage right out of the box, but also all these type of application frameworks that are now are coming into place and they're built for cloud native applications that they can leverage straight uh, from object storage. So I want to talk to you briefly about the structure of this demo and how, I, how it's prepared. The first thing is assuming that all of this is running on top of a Kubernetes cluster, right? So we're going to assume there's a Kubernetes API here. And we're going to also make the assumption that some CI CD pipeline is actually producing some artifacts. In this case, I'm going to have a CI CD pipeline that produces a Docker image. And it, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to have it deployed to a hardware uh, private Docker registry. I'm going to have hardware actually store it on top of object storage. 
This way, I'm not constrained by limitations of individual persistent volumes that I'm attaching to my hardware instances, but uh, I can also have hardware focus on the parts that are relevant to access control and all these other nice features that hardware has, but I'll, I'll delegate storage to MinIO. And additionally, I'm gonna assume there's an application running uh, on this cluster. And then for this application to start now, they can actually pull the images straight from hardware and hardware in turn will actually retrieve the image from MinIO. If this application, let's say, has also a database, right? I'll be deploying a Prometheus so I can collect usage metrics uh, from CPU memory utilization to number of API requests. I'll be collecting them not only from this application, but I can also have Prometheus collect these metrics straight from Kubernetes API. However, there's so much data you can fit into a persistent volume again, right? So um, if you are trying to go for the long run, you need to store all these metrics for the long uh, for the long term. And this is where Thanos comes into place. Thanos is a high availability deployment of Prometheus that can actually collect all these metrics and back them up into MinIO. Not only back them up, it can also compact them and query them straight from MinIO. So lastly, let's imagine additionally, some of these applications may have persistent volumes. So let's say you have to back up your cluster. So backing up your cluster or a snapshot in your persistent volumes, this is where Belero comes into place. Belero has the capability of backing up all the resources in your cluster, in, including your Kubernetes API configuration and snapshotting individual uh, persistent volumes and pushing all that data into MinIO, right? This allows, again, you can uh, start putting all this data uh, into MinIO and start scaling the MinIO independently without disrupting these applications. They, they can keep running forever on modified and you can just keep adding space or you can even start controlling how the storage ha uh, happens on MinIO. All right, to start the demo, I'm gonna I'll create a new, brand new MinIO tenant using one of the examples on the MinIO operator repository. Uh, this custom resource definition allows me to quickly define a brand new tenant with a specific capacity. And all I have to do is simply apply uh, my, tenant, my tenant definition. After I have applied the definition, I'll see that my tenant gets instantiated and initialized uh, this will in, in turn create a, a couple of uh, stateful sets. And additionally, uh, a series gets created. I've taken the liberty to set up an ingress controller uh, to this MinIO service that was defined for my tenant. This will allow me to open a new browser and go to, to my, the address I specify on my ingress controller. It's a convenient way to see my buckets and my objects that are that are stored on my object storage. As you can see, I already started by creating uh, four buckets, one for Harbor for storing my Docker images, one for Prometheus for storing all my long-term long metrics, as well as for my Thanos rules, and a bucket lastly for my Velero backups. I already installed uh, Harbor as, as you'll be able to see and it's already properly configured. I'm not going to go with this project. I'm going to create my own new project. And let's call it demo. I'm going to make it public no quota and hit create. So now I, I'm greeted with a brand new empty repo, uh, uh, project that has no repositories. I can see uh, it already offers me uh, uh, an example of push commands, which I'm going to oblige to. Uh, let's let's tag some images. So let's say uh, based on this recommendation, uh, I want to tag uh, a, a local container image that I have here. Let's see um, the latest MinIO release tag, and I'm going to place that here. And it seems to be only one level deep. And after I tag successfully the image. I'm going to first log in into my, my, my repository, my hardware repository. And after that, I'm going to perform my push operation. So as easy as that, I'll just push my, uh, my Docker images uh, into my hardware repository. 
And after the image gets pushed, if I go back to my Minio browser, I can quickly uh, refresh and see that now my image was pushed into my artifact and I can pretty much see. If I go back to my Minio browser, I will also see that the image, uh, the Docker image itself got pushed to my, my registry. When it comes to monitoring our set up uh, Thanos using the manifest from the repository that I mentioned earlier on, so what, uh, what, what this did was create a, a namespace uh, uh, called monitoring, uh, where I, uh, I'll be able to see all the stateful sets that have been installed, right? We have uh, uh, three stateful sets uh, for this deployment, and all of them have been properly configured with the, with the proper startup command. So just, so just to exemplify what I'm talking about, Let's look at the configuration of uh, the Prometheus stateful set. We, here we can see that all, all I really did uh, as custom configuration was pass a specific set of uh, object storage configuration uh, for my S3 uh, store. And I also mounted this configuration as a volume from the config map. With this in mind, essentially what's going to happen is every time uh, Prometheus is done uh, uh, compacting some of the images, Thanos is going to grab those images and store them back. So here, what I'm just going to do, I, I've configured Prometheus to have a very aggressive um, log rotation period. So every five minutes is actually sending files out. If I go to the Thanos logs, we can see pretty much uh, Th Thanos doing the effort of actually putting the objects into uh, the object storage periodically. Every time there's a new log, uh, Thanos pretty much takes it and pushes it into my Prometheus long-term bucket. Let's see how that information looks like. So we see here that every five minutes, a new uh, set of metrics are being collected by Prometheus from my Kubernetes cluster on my applications. And at the same time, Thanos is also taking those metrics that are being rotated every five minutes and starting them in our long-term bucket. And lastly, let's see Belero. To start a backup uh, on Belero is pretty, pretty straightforward. You will need to get the uh, Belero uh, CLI. With the Belero CLI, all you have to do real, really is uh, indicate that you want to perform a backup of your cluster. And this will, uh, in turn, schedule a backup to run with your Belero. So if we go into the, our Belero uh, pods, we'll see we'll see traces that uh, Belero is actually performing a full full bomb backup of my PVCs. For example, I have plenty of volumes for uh, my Prometheus deployment. Uh, for its databases, uh, also for hardware, is, is using some PVCs for, for its own database. And so it pretty much is snapshotting all these volumes that I'm using. Uh, along with this, uh, th uh, the backup will be beamed down to, to my uh, object storage, where I can actually see the backups that I'm performing. If I were to uncompress this file, I will see that there, there's a lot of inf uh, interesting information in this instance. For example, I can see a full backup of all my resources on my system, and if I were to explore, let's say, uh, my set of stateful set applications on all the namespaces, I'll see my hardware stateful sets uh, properly installed and backed up, as well as the tenant for my minio. So as you can see, all these operations frameworks can actually rely on uh, object storage because it is at its core of, of, of these operations. It simplifies the concern of what if I run out of space? And it makes it extremely scalable. You can take uh, these deployments from a few gigabytes to terabytes to petabytes to exabytes. Uh, the sky is the limit. So thank you for joining us in this conversation of Alcum Linux needs object storage. You can join us at any time on our Slack if you have any questions or on GitHub. You can uh, get started by reading our documentations or our blog post. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, our community thrives on, on individual collaborators and we wouldn't be here without our community. So thank you for your time and hope you have a great KubeCon.